possible by using this polynomial, but we don't want to actually compute the root. So the first thing we do is assume this thing is positive. It's not really an assumption, because if this number is negative, you just multiply across the equation by a, a negative 1. Make a n positive is what I probably should have said. OK? All right. So once you make a n positive, you look at these coefficients. OK? So it says a necessary condition for stability is all these things are positive. So you look at these coefficients. If even one of them is negative, you're done. It's unstable. OK? That's what necessary. Do you guys understand the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions? Necessary means, so in this case, it means if this thing is satisfied, the system might be stable. <laughs> if it's not satisfied, it's definitely not stable. It only can give you a negative answer. You can't verify stability. You can just verify instability at this point. Okay? Check these coefficients. If, as long as they're all positive, you keep proceeding. If even one of them is negative, you're done. System's unstable. Okay? All right. Once you've done this, then you have to do calculate the so-called array elements. Okay? I don't actually put them in an array like it does in the book, but you can look at the notes in the book and you see they form this huge array. But they only check the things in the left-hand column, so I'm just going to show you how to compute the things in the left column of the array. Okay? All right, so you start computing these coefficients. So you compute this coefficient b1. Okay? You see this depends on the coefficients of the polynomial up here. right? You can also see it doesn't make any sense to compute b1 unless you have a third-order polynomial. Right? I mean, if you don't have a third-order polynomial, what's that? Like a to the minus 1, right? So you're going to compute this if it's third order or higher, right? Compute this b1, OK? Now, if the thing is fifth order or higher, you're going to want to compute this thing, right? b2 by, by uh, calculating these coefficients here, OK? And then, um, let me see here. Oh, yeah. So I should have stepped back here. Okay, so if it's third or higher, you compute the b1 from these coefficients. The, this thing will depend on the parameters of the controller, right? Because, like, for example, if a0 depends on the parameter of the controller, and that's a0, so it will be 1, okay? All right, then you can use b1. You can see in this equation, once you have b1 and b2, you can compute this thing c1. You can just keep going forever. We rarely compute anything beyond this b1. I mean, in other words, if you look at the book, if this, if this polynomial was 12th order, you'd have to compute a lot of things. But I don't give you many problems where it's 12th order. Okay? Like, I don't tend to give you ones that are second order because they're too easy. It's usually third, maybe fourth order, something like that. Okay? So for that, you've got to compute the b1. Okay? You can see you have to compute the b2 if it's fifth order or higher. Otherwise, this term makes no sense. Okay? And then what you do is once you've computed all these um, coefficients, okay, the, the result tells you this. Okay? So a necessary and sufficient. So in other words, if this is true, the system is stable. Uh, for the system to be stable is all these elements in the left-hand column, which I don't actually put this in an array, but the book does. You'll see what I mean. So what I'm telling you is you, you have to compute this coefficient b1, c1. There's something called d1, e1. If the polynomial gets higher and higher, it's f1, g1. Okay, but it, no, you'll never need that. You have to make sure all those things are positive. Okay? So for, for example, if the if the... If the system was third order or fourth order, you just compute B1. You check if B1 is positive. If B1 is positive, you're, you're good. Okay? If it's fifth order, then you also need to compute B2. Okay? And then from B2, you can calculate C1. And then you need to check if B1 and C1 are positive. And you just keep going depending on the order of the polynomial. All right? All right, so let's see how this works. Now, you understand that. Like, I need this to be positive, right? That means I need this thing, b1, to be greater than 0, let's say. Right? That's what it means for them to be positive. Uh, b1 is going to depend on the parameters of the controller. So I'm going to get some inequalities I have to work with. And these inequalities will put bounds on the range of the controllers such that this is true. And those bounds will tell me for what values case the system is stable. I'll, I'll show you right now what I mean. All right, so let's play around with this example. This example comes from the very first example I used to motivate the method, OK? I mean, motivate the whole idea of stability. So you'll hate me for this. I'm enjoying this with the clicker. Um, 
that's this thing here. That's the characteristic polynomial for this problem. So if you took this problem, you formed the 1 plus GOL and simplified, you'd get exactly the thing in the denominator there. Okay? So now what I'm proposing to do is to use this method to see for what values of KC is this thing positive. Remember how I did at the beginning of class? I picked a value of KC, and then in principle, I took the inverse Laplace transform of the whole thing, plotted the response, saw if it was stable. So now I want to find what the roots of this are, and you can see this wouldn't be that easy to find um, because it's third order. You can't use a quadratic equation or anything like that, so we're going to use the method I just showed you. All right, so the first thing we do is check, is that thing positive? Yes, 10 is a positive number. Good. Now we check, is every coefficient positive? 10, check, 17, check, 8, check, uh, 1 plus Kc. So one condition here is 1 plus Kc has to be greater than 0. Right? Otherwise, that A0 term is not greater than 0. That tells you Kc has to be greater than minus 1. If Kc is not greater than minus 1, this term here is negative, and it's not stable. Okay? All right, so there's one, there's one bound. Okay? All right, so now this is a third order polynomial. I only have to compute this thing called B1. This is the equation just repeated from the previous page. Okay? So if N here is the order of the polynomial. My order is 3, so n is 3. So that makes this thing a2, this thing a1, okay? That's a3, a0 divided by a2. I just plug into this equation for n equal 3, okay? What is a2? a2 is this coefficient right there, 17. a1 is 8 minus a3, that's this guy, 10. And now a0 is this 1 plus kc divided by a2, which is 17. This thing has to be greater than 0, okay? This is going to put some bound on Kc. At this point, you need to simplify this to figure out what it is. It's not very useful information. Like, Kc has to satisfy that. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that is. So, whoops. So you have to do some simplification of this thing. Okay? I shouldn't even have this in the notes. All I'm showing you here is you don't need to compute B2. It's just confusing. I shouldn't have it there. Pretend like it's not there. Okay? And same thing with C1. These, these will provide no useful information. Just pretend like it's not here. In fact, I'll repost the thing without it there. All right. So this is a big leap of faith. All right. So I simplified this thing. So what did I do? I, first of all, multiplied across the equation by 17, right? Then I took this thing and moved it to the other side of the equation. I mean, this is obviously just algebra, but just so it doesn't appear like um, magic here. So I ended up with this equation. I don't know what 17 times 8 is, to be honest, but I know that has to be greater than, what is it, 10 times Kc, 10 times 1 plus Kc. Okay, and then you can divide through by 10, which again, I don't know exactly what that is. That has to be greater than 1 plus Kc. Okay, so that means Kc has to be less than, I'm going to bring this term and I guess that's 12.6. Just in case you're wondering how I took this thing here and ended up with this thing here, okay? So if you simplify this, which would have been a better use of our time than me showing you stuff you don't need here. But anyway, um, if you go ahead and simplify this inequality, you just have to be careful. These are inequalities, right? So if you multiply across by minus 1, you've got to switch the inequality. It's a little different than inequality, obviously. But you get, okay, Kc has to be less than 12.6. And up here you said Kc has to be greater than minus 1. That means the system is stable only in the range between those two. Greater than minus 1, less than 12.6. System is stable. All right. Now, two points here. This would be very hard to find using the methods that we just talked about. Okay. You remember, this, this is actually true, or it appears to be true based on what we did at the very beginning. Because you remember, we did this little example here. And I said, oh, 2 is OK, 6 is OK, 15 is not OK. Stability is somewhere between 6 and 15. We just found it's 12.6. OK, 12.6 system goes from stable to unstable. So something similar happens for negative values, but I don't show that. All right. OK. 
Um, so that means now you can limit your search for KC values that are in this range. Okay? Anything outside this range can't possibly work. All right. So that's method number one. Okay? Method number two is, called so, is something called direct substitution. So we're going to get out of here early, people. <laughs> I'm not as hungry as usual, but it'll be, I'll eat anyway. It's all right. Um, all right, so direct substitution. So what we're going to do here is take advantage of this idea that, so if we look at the complex plane, right, we're looking at the real part and we're looking at the imaginary part, and we know that if the system has roots over here, poles, closed loop poles, the system is stable, and if they're over there, it's unstable. Okay. So we can represent any point on this, in this plane like this, right? It has a real part I call alpha, it has an imaginary part I call omega, and then j is the imaginary number, right? Any number, any number in this complex plane can be represented like this with some value of alpha and some value of omega, right? Just parameterizes any point in this plane, that's all. All right. So along the, ima along the imaginary axis, right, the real part is zero. That means this is the equation for that axis, right? S equal j omega is this axis right here. And this axis divides the unstable region and the stable region from each other. Okay? So to use this method of direct substitution, you take this S equal J omega, you plug it into the characteristic equation, and then you'll end up generating a couple of equations because you're going to have one equation, but this equation is going to have a real part, and it's also going to have an imaginary part, and those two can't cancel each other, as I'm about to show you, so you're going to actually end up with two equations for this. And this is going to allow you to determine actually a little more information than before. It'll allow you to determine the range of stability for the KC. And it'll also allow you to determine this omega here, which I'm going to explain to you what omega means. But in a nutshell, omega is the, so if this system is, um, Let's say you've managed to find a value of Kc where the system is just barely stable, meaning the oscillations are sustained. Okay. The omega here represents the frequency of these oscillations. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you this in a minute. So it, it's nice because from this information, you can do controller tuning. And, and within the next week or so, I'll show you how to do this analysis and then use that to tune a, actually tune a controller. You understand, we're not tuning a controller now. For example, in this case, I haven't, we haven't decided what value of KC to pick. We've just decided what values of KC not to pick. Not less, not greater. All right? OK. Question? No, this is guaranteed to be stable in this range, OK? Right. Yeah. So the, the idea of this necessary condition is it tells you if you're, if you're not outside this range, if you are outside this range, you're definitely unstable, OK? But actually, he's got a good point here. That's actually a point I've struggled with my whole life. <laughs> OK, maybe, maybe not my whole life. Maybe, maybe the last, I don't know, 13 seconds or so. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's got a good point here. So see, I'm, the way I'm writing this is as if this was actually a sufficient condition, because that's what this implies, right? I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that if I have minus 1 half, that will be stable. Yeah, I don't actually think that's true. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I actually think this. This, this is going to, you I think at some point I told you this. You might remember this. When I first introduced PI control, I told you this. Like, I don't know how to pick the controller gain, but what I know is I should pick the controller gain to have the same sign as the process gain. So if I multiplied two together, they're always positive. You might recall I said this, okay? All right. And... I'm pretty sure that, for, well, for this particular problem, if you went back, you'll find the process gain is positive. <coughs> so if I actually used a KC of minus 1 half, that wouldn't be true. So let me rework this. That's the most insightful question I've ever had in my whole life. You sh I say we give them no bonus points. 
your, co your colleagues agree that um, you get zero points for your insight. But uh, so I think the truth here is that anything above zero is okay, but not anything, but not negative, actually. Because it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient, which is sloppiness on my part. I'll come back to that. What's that? I need to think more about this. I'm just, I'm just asking you to give me, I'll, I'll clarify this uh, when I come in. Actually, I can do it probably the beginning of class tomorrow, okay? I don't want to think on my feet. It's risky, okay? All right. Now, of course, we get, some, we get the same answer over here, so we're going to have to rectify this. But this, this makes it more interesting. All right, so now back to this. So we're going to use this um, direct substitution method. So again, S equals J omega, that divides the real part. Sorry, this divides the unstable region from the stable region. So the idea is that I'm going to take this, I'm going to substitute S equal J omega into the characteristic equation. Okay, so substitute, I'll get an equation involving omega now. This will also involve KC, so it'll be an equation that, for example, will have KC and omega. And I'm going to end up getting two equations for this, one for the real part of that equation, one for the imaginary part. I'll solve these two s equations simultaneously to find the KCs that make the system stable and the corresponding omegas. You'll see something like this will lead to an omega equals zero, and this will be a different kind of omega. I'll have to explain that when I do this example. Okay, same, same example here, okay? Same answer, so this should be interesting, <laughs> right? All right. Okay, so here's our characteristic equation. Plug in S equals J omega. Hopefully everyone knows how to deal with imaginary numbers that I call J and you might have called I in other classes. I don't know. Um, so right, if you take the cube of this thing, obviously you get omega cubed, you get J cubed. J squared is minus one. So right, that gives you minus J. Everyone following me there? Okay. Uh, you plug it into this equation here, J omega squared, you get omega squared, you get J squared, that gives you the minus one, that's just J omega, and that's just one plus KC. Okay, so you have this equation, okay? And now you want to solve this, and you, and you think, well, it's got two unknowns, I don't know what this omega thing is, and I don't know what the KC is, but actually this is two equations, because, for example, there's no way for some, something that's imaginary to cancel something that's real. So for this equation to be equal, the real part has to be equal to zero, and the imaginary part has to be equal independently of each other. Okay? So that's where I get two equations. All right? Um, so for the real part, I get this equation, right? That real term and this real term. Okay, that has to be equal to zero, and then from the imaginary part, those two terms, that has to be equal to zero. Okay? All right. So obviously, this equation is easier to deal with first because it only involves omega. This is going to have three roots, because it's a cube, right? Um, you can see that two of the roots are omega zero, right? And the other root is, well, this, <laughs> okay? How did I get that? I divided through by omega, and I got, well, just so we can see where that came from. I'm going to regret erasing that, no doubt. Okay, so certainly you can see omega is the solution to this equation, right? And if we divide through by, and yeah, divide through by j omega, you get minus 10 omega squared, and then you have plus 8 equals 0. So that tells you omega equals plus or minus the square root of what? 8 divided by 10. Obviously, the, ne the negative, well, I shouldn't say obviously, the negative root doesn't mean anything to us for reasons I'll explain in a minute. So I guess if you evaluate that thing, you get 0.894. Yeah? So that's like 1 over the distance between peaks and the response. Well, um, that's the period, right? I mean, so we know, you know what the period of the oscillation is, right? So, um, so it's, uh, I'm trying to say, is it, it's 2 pi omega. Geez, this is something that should be, this is something, it's like, um, you know how a bird knows to g gather food for its young? I should know this. It's the same way, okay. Is it 2 pi omega? I'm trying to remember, is it a, I think that's right, because I think omega equals, yeah, the period divided by 2 pi. I, I need to check these, but I think that's right. So the point is, if you know the period, it's easy to calculate the omega, okay. 
I think that's right. I'll be embarrassed if it's not, but whatever. All right. So that's how I found the omega here, right? So one omega is zero, the other omega is this. We throw this negative one away because it doesn't mean anything to us. Because I'll explain, the omega has a physical interpretation that I'm about to explain to you. Okay, now we have this equation, okay? Now we have two values of omega. So if we use omega equals zero, you just get that. Then we get the infamous Kc equals minus one. Remember him? Okay, all right. And then if you put in omega equal either plus or minus, it makes no difference here. Right? Evaluate it, then you'll get another value for Kc, you'll get 12.6. Alright, so this, okay, this implies the following, that um, these are the, so when you do this uh, substitution, what you're doing is you're finding the bounds of stability. That means these are the values that place one of the closed loop poles exactly on this axis. So it's at the precipice of instability. It's stable, but just barely, okay? So one of these, so you have two of these critical points, minus one and 12.6. The idea is that below minus one, system is not stable. Above 12.6, it's not stable. And um, the nice thing about this omega, well, there's a couple of nice things. You see that this, you might recall, the minus one is associated with this omega equals zero. So this tells you if you choose a Kc greater, sorry, less than minus one, you're going to get an instability with a zero frequency. That also means purely exponential, right? Because in general, these, um, these terms that are in the solution look like something like this, e to the at sine omega t, right? Like that. that. The omega represents the frequency of the oscillation. So if omega is zero, that means the term just looks like e to the at. It's purely exponential. So, so this is telling you, if you were to go below minus one, the kind of instability that you're going to get is a purely exponential instability. It looks like that. It looks like that, okay? So it's kind of a little more information. You've, you've not only determined what the range of stability is, but you've determined if you go below or above what exact kind of instability you get. Okay, if we go back to this. Then you, you notice also when we did this evaluation that this omega is associated with that Kc. So this tells you if you go above Kc equal 12.6, you're going to get an oscillatory instability, and it's going to have that frequency. Okay. Um, so that means in that case, it would be an instability that looks like that. Okay. And when we go to design controllers. We're actually going to use this Kc here and this omega here. We're going to call that thing the ultimate gain. We're going to call that thing the ultimate frequency. And we're going to actually find ways to tune the controller. Again, we haven't tuned the controller. I've just told you, don't consider Kcs outside this range. Okay. Now comes the fun part. Okay, so this analysis says this is the range. Remember I gave my whole tirade over here based on his question. I was like, oh, this a mistake here. Uh, so. Here's my conclusion at this point, right? It's a working, it's a working document, this, my, this problem, is that this is actually the stability range, because that is what this gives you. But I don't, as he mentioned, I don't see how exactly you, I have proven that this works less than minus. I don't see that I, I'm treating this as if it's sufficient, even though up here I called it um, just necessary. So. I think this is the right answer, and I, because of because I did it another way and got the same answer. In this way, I can see that it's definitely true. But I, ha I need to sh I need to come back tomorrow and sh tell you how I actually prove this rig more rigorously. So if you could just wait for that, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So you see, this is kind of nice, right? Because for some arbitrary characteristic polynomial, now we can find the range of the parameters that are control that are stable. And we can even say something about the nature of the instability if it's not. And then ultimately, we can use values like this to actually tune controllers. Okay. Now, you might get some problems in the homework, um, and I guess potentially a test, where you do the same kind of problem like this, except I, the controller is not proportional, it's PI. Okay. So guess what? When you multiply out this whole thing, you're going to have KC and tau i floating around. 
And when you form these kind of inequalities using either the Ruth method or use this direct substitution, these things are going to get more unwieldy to deal with, to like form the bounds, okay? You'll see what I mean when you get an example. You do the same thing, it's just, you, you can imagine if, this, if you had an equation like this and you had kc in this term and then tau i in that term and then I asked you for what values, it would get some complica more complicated looking expressions, right? So the, there's more algebra, the same concept applies. Okay, so this is the last slide, which is awesome, because this means the Caesar salads won't be all sold out down there on the first floor, all right? If you go too late, you gotta get a Cobb salad, you know, just like, don't really like those as much. All right, so what I'm doing in this particular case is showing you how you can do all of this um, pretty quickly in, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm just using the tools in, this isn't really Simulink, this is MATLAB, I kinda use them interchangeably. MATLAB is the command prompt, right? Simulink means the whole block diagram thing, but I kind of use them interchangeably. But this is purely done in MATLAB. So what I'm doing here is I want to determine when the system is stable, and I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, the same example we chose um, for the fir very first motivating example. So proportional controller, process first order, valve first order, measurement device first order. So what I'm going to do in MATLAB, is I'm going to form all these transfer functions, right? Hopefully you know how to do this at this point. I'm calling it GP because I want to, it's a good name, right? I'm forming a transfer function that looks like one over five S plus one. Everyone knows how to use this, I hope at this point, right? Um, I'm forming the valve to be that transfer function, GM to be that transfer function. I'm at this point saying, you remember in Laplace domain, uh, proportional controller is just a gain. I'm calling at this point that number six. It's a gain of six I'm using now. And I'm taking the KM, which is just the gain of this thing, right? I told you, if you want to find the, well, you can see by, this, by the way I've written it, the gain is one. But if you want to find a gain of a transfer function, just set S equals zero. So the gain of this is one. And then I'm forming this thing. What is this thing? That's the closed loop transfer function, right? Also known as GCL, just because I wanted to call it that. So I'm just calculating, excuse me, don't hate me. Um, I'm just calculating that thing right there, okay? Right there, okay? All right, go back, way back, okay. So that's the numerator of that thing, that's the denominator, that's the one plus GOL. So if you do this, specify all this thing, issue this command, I don't put a semicolon because I want to see the answer, it spits this thing out, okay? All right, and at this point, because, you know, I'm doing this in MATLAB, so I actually I had to specify a value of KC. So for that value of KC, this is the close of transfer function. So clearly, system is stable if, if, the, if all the roots of this thing are the, have negative real part, right? This is not something you'd enjoy factoring by yourself, by hands, fifth order polynomial. Um, so you, these are, I'm just illustrating some commands you can use in MATLAB. So you can take this, so this is literally what it says, is stable. It's a question. Is this transfer function stable? In other words, check all the roots of this for me. Make sure they all have negative real part. And if it's stable, tell me it is by giving me a one. Otherwise, it gives you a zero. Okay? So if you only wanted to know whether it was stable, you just issue that command. If you actually want to know what the poles actually are of this beast, then you can calculate the poles of this thing. It'd be the same as forming that polynomial and finding the roots. But you just issue pole this thing, it'll find the roots of this thing. There's five of them, obviously. Two of them are strictly real. One's a complex conjugate pair. They all have negative real part, okay? Then you can also compute the zeros if you wanted to. So if someone asked me, what is the response of this system gonna look like? I'm, I said it's gonna be oscillatory, but it'll be stable and shouldn't have an inverse response because none of these are positive, right? So the same kind of thing we did with open loop systems. You can extract a lot of information. Let me do one thing and then I'll let you go. So let's say that It's not open, hold on. Bingo. Okay, so then I did what? Uh, pole, was it pole or poles? I think. Yeah. Okay, so that's the answer I just gave. 
Now, if you were to come up here and decide that you wanted, we know for this problem the stability limit is 12.6, right? So if I were to pick this thing to be 15, I expect it to be not stable. So now I can reform the transfer function. I get a different denominator. I can check the poles, and I see um, now I've generated a couple of poles that have positive real parts. System is not stable. Instability is going to be oscillatory, right? Because these are, these are oscillatory roots. And these oscillations are going to grow. And uh, the frequency, so this is the same information we kind of extracted analytically using the direct substitution method. I just wanted to illustrate you could do some of this in MATLAB. Okay, so I will see you tomorrow.